News at noon starts right now. Our weather roller coaster continues, even though it's been quiet today. Our meteorologists are keeping an eye on the sky. Storm chances ramp up tonight. Some of them could bring a lot of rain to the area. Justin Horn has the latest forecast. Justin. Yeah, you see right behind you there, David. We still have a lot of cloud cover. It looks kind of gloomy outside. We're not looking for rain today. So Friday plans just fine. It's tonight where we could see some storms move in, and I want to be clear that not everyone's going to see rain out of this. We're going to watch some storms build in central Texas and then work their way down into our area. So let me show you when I think rain chances are at their highest, and that is overnight tonight. So don't be surprised if you're woken up by some rumbles of thunder overnight. We're going to put in a 40% chance, and we do need to mention there is a threat for a couple of strong storms there too. Then as we work into your Saturday, maybe some Rain Saturday morning, but most of Saturday afternoon looks OK, so good for any weekend plans there. And then we'll bring rain chances back up just a little bit Sunday morning as some showers work in from the west. So that's how the weekend is looking. It's not a weekend where again you have to get rid of all your plans, but we do have to watch uh, for some storms overnight. This is the risk for severe weather, and I think hail and gusty winds would be the main issues. And there are for the most part on the low end, but again, it is something that it needs to be watched as we go outside for you. It's still cloudy, but the sun comes out today. It'll be hot this afternoon. There are those storms overnight, a few strong, and then maybe some showers early on your Sunday. And as we look at the satellite picture right now, ah, the clouds still right over Bear County. Everyone else is seeing sun, uh, but we're still cloudy. 78 degrees. Those clouds will shrink and eventually go away. And temperatures will jump into the 80s like everyone else is seeing right now. And eventually we could be up near 90 this afternoon. We'll talk much more about these storms. That weekend forecast will break it down for you and get into next week as well. Coming up in just a couple minutes. Thank you, Justin. It was a tragic day felt across the country after a gunman opened fire at Robb Elementary School in Uvalde. As we've reached the one year anniversary, we are sharing stories from the community as it continues to try to heal. ABC News also following the story. Tonight, a special episode of ABC's 2020 will focus on Uvalde. It includes teacher Arnie Reyes as he attempts to recover from his physical injuries and the mental anguish of losing all 11 of his students. As a teacher, as an educator, you never think about losing a student. to lose like 11 at a time. I mean, it's a lot at once. That poor man. The two hour special, It Happened Here, A Year in Uvalde, airs tonight right here on KSAT 12. It all starts at eight o'clock. And coming up in just a few minutes, we're going to be talking to ABC's John Quinones about all these stories that he has covered in his time here in Uvalde. And there's no doubt the shooting on May 24th, 2022 has deeply affected Uvalde, the surrounding communities and beyond. We hope you'll join us next week as we look back at the past year with families, survivors and residents during our special one year in Uvalde. The in-depth report airs this coming Wednesday, May 24th at 9 p.m. here on KSAT 12. Schools around San Antonio are going to be marking the anniversary of the Robb Elementary mass shooting. They're going to be donating blood in its honor on Tuesday. The superintendents and officials at these school districts say that they were inspired to donate in part because of 10-year-old Maya Zamora's story of survival. She has become an advocate for blood donations over the last year since it saved her life. The blood donations will attempt to serve as a reminder that it was the blood on the shelves at the time of the shooting in Uvalde that went on to be used for patients. South Texas Blood and Tissue Center says blood donations in our area are always in short supply. And if you would like to help out, we have more information on our website, ksat.com. In other news this noon, police are searching for the car and the driver who left a man for dead this morning in the road. Alyssa Cole at the scene where a passerby found the man, his crashed bike, but not the person responsible. On Roland Avenue near Rigsby Road, just before 2 a.m., a Samaritan driving through the area found a man's body and a bike in the middle of the road. According to police records, the body and bike had been there after a driver crashed into the biker traveling westbound on Roland Avenue. 
The driver crashed into the biker after failing to properly navigate the winding curves on the road. The driver ran into the motorcyclist after failing to properly navigate the winding curves on the road. When police arrive, the victim was pronounced dead on sight. Police also say the suspect driver failed to stop and render aid. We're still waiting to learn the identity of the victim as detectives continue to carry out this investigation. Alyssa Cole, KSAC 12 News. A woman hurt after rolling her vehicle overnight. San Antonio police say that crash happened just after 1 o'clock on Loop 410 and Bandera Road on the city's northwest side. The woman driving apparently lost control of the car, hit another car, rolled over on 410 just before the Bandera exit. She was taken to University Hospital and surprisingly just had minor injuries. The city of Seguin trying to use every tool it can to fight rising property crime. They're asking businesses and homeowners with security cameras to voluntarily register them with police. The internal map or list would be used by police to speed up investigations. Other cities like Leon Valley, New Braunfels, and Castle Hills also have the voluntary registry. Police Chief Jason Brady points out that it's not mandatory for people on the list to hand over any video, but it could help in those investigations. It's not just video. It's, it's, it, the video may lead us to look in a certain area or uh, know about a certain more uh, precisely time of day, and then we can kind of narrow in and tailor our investigation to, to sort of uh, ferret out those leads that would be productive. Business owners we spoke with said they'd be willing to register with police if it would help keep property crimes down. Right now, we're on standby for Governor Greg Abbott in the next hour. He is going to be visiting border communities all day. And at 1 o'clock, he's going to give an update on the migrant influx and the new rules the Biden administration added for asylum seekers last week. Abbott's press conference around 1 o'clock this afternoon. It's in Brownsville. He's going to be joined by Texas Department of Public Safety Director Steve McCaw and Texas Border Czar Mike Banks. And you can watch the governor's update live on KSAT.com. Now to the workplace shooting in Ohio, where two people were shot at a factory, one of them dying. Others were injured in that chaos. Police calling this a targeted attack. ABC's Rena Roy tells us that the suspect in the hospital with what authorities are saying is a self-inflicted gunshot wound. First responders racing to this diesel engine factory outside of Dayton, Ohio, Thursday night after calls of an active shooter. There are multiple units there. We were able to quickly identify and locate a shooting suspect outside the facility. One person killed, another is recovering after being shot. One male who was uh, pronounced deceased at the scene and a second male who suffered a gunshot wound that was not life-threatening. Our victim in this case has been identified uh, by the Montgomery County Coroner's Office as 28-year-old Jeffrey James Allen III. The suspect produced a semi-automatic handgun, shot and killed Mr. Allen. Employees were working on the floor when the gunman opened fire and chaos ensued. The suspect in this case did fire multiple rounds. We know of at least a dozen rounds that were fired. It's believed that all of those rounds were targeted towards Mr. Allen. Both the suspect and Mr. Allen were apparently involved in a domestic-related feud over a female who was also an employee of the facility. Authorities say the suspect is now recovering at the hospital from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Rena Roy, ABC News, New York. A music festival that's had audiences dancing for more than four decades is back. We've got a preview of the lively event and how it helps keep traditional Conto music alive. We're marking the one year anniversary of the mass shooting in Uvalde by sharing people's stories. ABC News also highlighting the community's resilience. After the break, ABC's John Quinones joining us live to talk about a special edition of 2020 that is airing tonight. It has been nearly one year since the deadly shooting at Robb Elementary, and although the Uvalde community is still healing from that loss, the community has come a long way. KSAC crews have been on the ground tracking these stories of resilience, but we're not the only ones. ABC News is airing a special edition of 2020 Tonight focusing on Uvalde. We are joined right now by the point man for this uh, 2020 special edition, John Quinones, San Antonio's own son, 
Uh, okay. This is something we're really looking forward to because I know this has been a, a year of dedication by you and your Thank staffers. You. Thank you, Ursula. It's been an amazing experience, unprecedented. You know, it's hard to believe that it's been almost a year now since the mass shooting at Rob Elementary. And when we arrived there back in May of 24th of 2022, we realized that this story was so immense and so heartbreaking that we wouldn't do it justice if we covered it just the way we covered other mass shootings. So often the media goes into a town, the scene of these things, and we spend a few weeks there and then we move on to the next one, right? Because God knows there's always the next one. Well, ABC News decided this wouldn't happen this time. We would open up an office right there in the heart of Uvalde uh, with producers and correspondents. I'm not the only one to, you know, Maria Elena Salinas and Mireya Villarreal and, and uh, camera crews, and we would stay. And I think what you will see tonight is the fruit of all that. You know, you will see, you know, surveillance video that's never been seen before, body cam video, interviews, not only with the families of the victims, but also with the survivors, teachers and students. This truly is, in the end, despite the pain, a story about courage and strength and tremendous resilience and also of tremendous spirit of these people in the face of the unthinkable. We look forward to those those personal stories that you're going to be telling tonight. But how far has this community come? You've been there so many times. How far have they come since last year? You know, they become real activists. Many of them, uh, the folks who uh, are in pain, turn that pain into activism, uh, protesting, you know, uh, for gun laws in, in Austin and coming all the way up to Washington, D.C. There's a little girl, 10 year old Caitlin Gonzalez, who's become tremendous activist and outspoken critic. Uh, of government officials, and she's now always talking also in Austin and in, uh, in Washington. And as we approach the one-year mark, there are some folks in the town who don't want the media there anymore. They're like, enough is enough. Um, well, not the families of the victims. They want us there. They want us asking questions, holding people's feet to the fire, the authorities' feet to the fire, asking, you know, why did it take 77 minutes for these almost 400 police officers to take down the shooter? Had they acted sooner, might lives of students and teachers have been saved? And they tell us only when they have their answers, and they don't have them yet. The district attorney has not given this case over to a grand jury yet. There are so many answers that they don't have yet. But until they do so, they tell us, will they be able to at least try to move forward? You always put so much emotion into all of your reporting. Um, sometimes it's fun, sometimes it's very yeah. sad, as this has been. How has the last year been on you personally, returning to San Antonio, living here oh, and man. covering this horrific well, story? I, I was born and raised you know, in San Antonio, right there on the west side. So when I heard about it, th these people, these victims, uh, look like my family, you know, these could have been my kids or my nephews and nieces, the two teachers could have been my sisters. The neighborhood that's around Rob Elementary looks like the neighborhood I grew up on the west side. They speak Spanish. There are humble people, there are quiet people, and not used to the, uh, the attention of the mass media coming into town with hundreds of reporters and the glare of network television crews. I knew that we were going to have to be gentle and so did the president of ABC News, who told us, look, we're going to spend some time here and resources, and we're going to move in to Uvalde for a year. And that's what it took, because only then, when they trusted us and they knew that the folks knew that we weren't leaving, and I could also speak their language, they started opening up their homes and their hearts to us. And I the emotion con emotional connection that you have with that community, being from South Texas, mm -hmm. you can tell their stories in ways that nobody else really can. So we really look forward to this special tonight. ABC Thank could you, not have Thank chosen you. a better person to come here and tell that yeah. story. You yeah. are yeah. absolutely the perfect person for this job. And we look forward to your special yeah. tonight. Thank you. And you are my favorite anchor in San Antonio, Ursula. I paid so him thank to you. say that. I know. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. All right, John. It worked. Thanks a lot. <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> we'll see you. David tried to outbid me for yeah, that. I did, but I didn't work. Didn't work. It's all right. Okay, our favorite meteorologist, <laughs> Justin Horn.
watching the storms coming in tonight. Yeah, nothing right now. We've still got cloudy skies, but we're starting to see some glimpses of sun there. And I think the sun does pop out a little bit uh, later today. Actually, probably here within the next couple of hours, we're going to see some sun things warm up. The aquifer dropped today for the first time in a while. It's down three tenths of a foot to 646.4. In your pollen count, molds are high, 1,450. Grass is low at 20. We'll talk about those storms. We'll time it out for you and let you know what you can expect all weekend long coming up. Looking forward to tonight, actually. I mean, yeah. we don't need the severe thunder and lightning, but it is Friday, so if you're awake all night because there's a little lightning and thunder, then yeah, watch right. the ABC special, yeah. the 2020 special, sure. and then hunker down and watch our live stream. Yeah, we we may be on tonight if if it warrants that. It's not going to be rainy all night long, and it's not going to be severe weather everywhere. In fact, not everyone's going to get rainfall, but. There is the potential for some storms overnight, so we have to mention that. And we're watching a front, an actual cold front. How long has it been since we've talked about that? And look at the difference it's making up there in the Texas Panhandle. 65 in Amarillo, 74 in Lubbock, out ahead of this 80s and some 70s here. Why are we cooler than everyone else? Well, because we still have some clouds over top of us right now, but those clouds are quickly going away. And once the sun pops out, we should jump into the 80s too and make our way up to near 90 this afternoon out ahead of this cool front, which will cool us down for the weekend. There's the setup and you see behind it lots of clouds. There were severe storms yesterday across Amarillo and this front does push south pretty quickly this afternoon, developing storms across central Texas. This is five o'clock. Uh, notice it's all north of us though. So the rest of our Friday looks fine until we get uh, into the overnight hours. And once that happens, we could see some of those storms work in our direction as this front sags south. So the Storm Prediction Center has put a large portion of our area in the scattered risk for severe weather on a scale of one to five, about a two. And what does that mean? Well, I think the, the main threats here are going to be hail and gusty winds, and it's probably going to be early on. Once these storms kind of continue to push south, they'll weaken some. But we'll keep an eye out on the radar and certainly if anything does uh, become severe, we'll be here to let you know about it. Here's a little closer look at the forecast and we can kind of time it out for you. So 10 p.m. Yeah, not much there. The storms are still well to our north, but they gather into a complex of showers and storms in this particular model. And by the way, uh, these uh, high resolution models, they're going to flip flop, kind of go back and forth. It's not exact. Uh, but this one keeps the bulk of the heavy rain west of San Antonio, bringing some showers in and maybe a few rumbles of thunder by 7 a.m. tomorrow morning. So in this scenario, San Antonio would miss out on a lot of heavier rain. That would be west of us. There are some models that bring it a little bit closer to town. So it's just going to be a matter of where some of those storms develop. Then as we head towards midday tomorrow, everything dies down. A lot of times these storm systems kind of zap all the energy out of the atmosphere. And so you'll, you'll get quieter conditions, I think, through much of Saturday. This is 5 o'clock, still not a lot there. But you'll notice we're starting to see some showers down there along the Rio Grande, and that's some energy that's starting to come in from the south and west. And by Sunday morning, I think we'll see some showers around the area, and some of those could work through San Antonio. First half of the day, second half of Sunday should be just fine. So there's a couple of windows here that we've got to watch for some rainfall. Rain chances next few days, highest tonight. We drop it to 20% on Saturday and then back up to 30%, especially Sunday morning for some of those showers. And then it drops off again as we get into next week. There's the scene outside right now. Still mostly cloudy to cloudy. Temperatures near 80. And you look at the cloud cover, it really is just right over San Antonio. But we're starting to see those breaks now across the southern half of the county, and that will spread north. 86 Pleasanton, 81 Hondo, where there is sun now. 80 in Kerrville, 85 in New Valley. So much warmer around us because, again, the sun is out. Uh, here in town, though, upper 70s at the moment. Our case had 12-hour forecast, 88 at 3 o'clock. We're up near 90 by 5 p.m. And then we begin to add in the rain chances, 30% at 10 p.m., up to 40% by midnight with temperatures in the 70s. And, yes, it will be cooler this weekend thanks to that front. 81 Saturday, mostly cloudy again during the afternoon. We get those showers Sunday morning. That'll keep things pretty cool on Sunday, 79. But the sun is back out in full force Monday, 86. Small rain chance Tuesday, otherwise hot and humid much of next week. Thank you, Justin.
Canuto music fans putting on their dancing shoes as an annual festival is back. How organizers say the genre continues to evolve. It is a festival showcasing the best that Conjunto Music has to offer. It attracts people from all over Texas, all over the country, even all over the world. Tiffany Huerta spoke to the founder of the Tejano Conjunto Festival about this year's event and what has kept the love for this music alive for more than 40 years. We actually started it 43 years ago. That celebrates Conjunto Music, which is an original American musical ensemble and style of music that we as Tejanos, or as Texas Mexicans, created back around the early 1900s, late 1800s. Musician Juan Tejeda is the founder of the Tejano Conjunto Festival and shares his love for this music. Uses the uh, European, usually German, uh, but an accordion as its principal instrument. Tejeda welcomes the community to enjoy these sounds at the 41st annual Tejano Conjunto Festival. It's the oldest and largest conjunto music festival in the world. Friday morning, preparations were underway. The three-day festival kicks off today at Rosedale Park at 5.30 p.m. Last year, more than 9,000 people attended the festival. Tejeda says you will hear how Conjunto music continues to evolve. We play indigenous huapangos, we play African-based uh, cumbias and boleros from the Caribbean, and you know we play country music is big within Conjunto Tejano music. Uh, jazz, blues, rock, so it's this fusion. And some of the young bands are combining all of these things. 30 conjunto bands from across Texas will be performing, plus students from San Antonio and the Rio Grande Valley. We want to keep this musical tradition alive, to preserve it, to promote it, to pass it on to the future generations. Tiffany Huertas, KSET 12 News. Sounds of San Antonio right there. A volcano in Mexico, it's starting to rumble. And although it's not quite erupting yet, it's still disrupting life in several villages. The health concerns and warnings to residents after the break. Oh, it's Friday. You know what that means. SA Live loves to bring the star power to end the week. And you can guess who this is. He's been on a ton of movies, TV shows. They're going to reveal who it is coming up. Mystery guess. Uh, Graphic and tearful testimony on Thursday from those who were first on the scene of a shooting and stabbing that took an 11 month old baby's life. Her father, the accused murderer, his bond hearing underway in court. Stephen Clare charged with capital murder and two counts of aggravated assault. The first to respond to the scene described for the judge how Claire's ex-wife was found lying in her own blood from multiple gunshot wounds. I, I really thought she was going to die in my arms. I applied pressure to help her and I spoke to her to keep her breathing just to let her know that she's not alone. That mother did survive. Other officers also described how the two-year-old and 11-month-old daughters were lying on the floor as well, covered in blood. They'd been stabbed. The hearing about Claire's bond, which is at $3.5 million, prosecutors want to revoke it. His attorneys want it lowered. It is unclear when the judge will eventually make that decision. A volcano in Mexico has started rumbling again. It's spitting out steam and gas and ash, all coming out of the volcano just southeast of Mexico City. Ash fall from the volcano is causing a concern in Puebla. The local health secretary is recommending people wear face masks or protective glasses, as well as avoid outdoor activities so they don't get sick. Authorities also recommend residents don't eat in the streets and make sure pet food doesn't become contaminated with the ash. Eleven villages were forced to cancel school. And at least 14 people have been killed in flooding in northern Italy. Local officials say that they've had six months worth of rain in just 36 hours. Nearly 1,100 firefighters are currently deployed in the relief operations. Several people still missing, thousands displaced. River teams of the Italian firefighters have been deployed to one town where they had to evacuate 30 people stuck at a hotel due to high water. It's an accounting error that's apparently freed up billions more dollars 
in aid for Ukraine. That's according to multiple congressional administrative officials. They say the White House made an accounting error in assessing the value of military support given to Ukraine to date. So this week, lawmakers and congressional staffers were briefed on this error. It was discovered two months ago. The error frees up approximately $3 billion plus over the next $2 billion that the Pentagon accounted for in the fund. Some lawmakers believe that this likely is going to mitigate the need for Congress to pass an additional assistance package before the end of the fiscal year in September. Speaking of Ukraine, let's take you to the first day of the G7 summit. President Joe Biden meeting with fellow world leaders in Japan, displaying the strength of their alliance amid growing aggressions from China and Russia's war in Ukraine. The seven nations unveiling new sanctions against Russia. ABC's M. Wynn explains it comes as debt ceiling talks in Washington loom over the president's truncated trip. President Joe Biden gathering with fellow world leaders in Hiroshima, Japan for the Group of Seven Summit. The nations unveiling tough new sanctions on Russia meant to choke off Moscow's war financing and further disrupt its ability to sustain its invasion of Ukraine. This as Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky prepares to make a surprise appearance this weekend to continue appealing for more military assistance. The geopolitical and diplomatic significance of these meetings should not be understated. Zelensky moving to firm up and widen international support as his forces here in eastern Ukraine go on the offensive. At the Hiroshima Peace Memorial, Biden and his G7 counterparts paying tribute to the lives lost there 78 years ago, meeting privately with a survivor of the first atomic bomb used in warfare. The location significant as the Japanese prime minister's hometown underscoring the host's continued efforts to rid the world of nuclear weapons. Today, the U.S. president departing the G7 leaders dinner early to receive an update from Washington about how talks are going on the debt ceiling. This weekend, a critical deadline for negotiations. A deal must be reached to allow Congress enough time to vote on it to ensure the U.S. doesn't go into default. Biden had also met with his team the day before, where officials say he was informed steady progress is being made and that the president remains confident a deal can be reached. I see the path that we can come to an agreement. And I think we have the structure now. The president shortened his trip to return to the White House Sunday for any debt ceiling talks. The quad leaders he was supposed to meet next week in Australia will now meet with him Saturday in Japan. M1, ABC News, Washington. Taking a look outside with live cam. The clouds are moving in, the temperature rising, but we have a cold front coming. We do. It actually will cool us down this week. And so if it's been a little steamy for you lately, we've got some good news on that front. And you can see some blue skies starting to take shape there. So these clouds are beginning to break up. And yes, we're going to see quite a bit of sun this afternoon. Let's uh, take you hour by hour through the forecast here. Uh, as you plan out your afternoon, know that the rest of your Friday looks good. 0% on the rain chance through 8 p.m. There's your high temperature at 5 o'clock, 90. We'll go partly cloudy as we head into tonight. Then we start to add in some rain chances starting around 10 o'clock, but really building after midnight to about 40%. That's when we could see some thunderstorms. Maybe a couple strong ones mixed in there, too. We've been talking about the storm threats. Uh, we always get asked about hail when these storms have hail. It's possible with some of the stronger storms. I don't think we're going to see widespread severe weather, but we certainly can't rule that out today along with some gusty winds. So we want to make you aware of that uh, with some of the stronger storms overnight into very early Saturday morning. We're still watching that cloud cover, but it is really starting to uh, dissipate. And uh, here in San Antonio, we're at 78. I anticipate that number jumps up very quickly here over the next couple of hours with more sun uh, starting to move in. 86 in Pleasanton. We're already closing in on 90 down there in Catula, where it has been sunny for most of the morning. 77 in Helota, 75 Bernie Stage, 78 in Bull Verde. We'll talk more about the weekend forecast and take another look at the computer models and show you exactly where we think these storms will move. That's coming up here in just a couple of minutes, guys. Thank you, Justin. Hey, there's some good news for the Los Angeles Lakers. They're going home. The bad news is they're going home down 0-2 to the Nuggets. We'll show you why coming up in sports. Temperatures heating up, so does the box of box office. We have your summer blockbuster preview, plus how one film could have a big impact on the film industry. It's coming up after the break. <laughs> 